Would you be surprised to learn that the liqueurs you love might be over 400 years old? I mean the recipe. Bowles Distillery in Amsterdam has been producing liqueurs since the 16th century. So how perfect to have the Bowles brand experience manager teach us how to drink liqueurs. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. My friend Jamie Campbell was a guest on Lush Life previously, but that was before he donned the title of Bowles Brand Experience Manager. Now we talk all day about how much we love liqueur-based cocktails. Those lovely dessert cocktails, the Martinez, the herbal hot toddies are all made with liqueurs. It's a vast category and so perfect to examine in this, my how to drink season. But before we get started, just a heads up that the cocktail of the week is coming up right after we chat to Jamie. So if you live in the UK and want to buy any of the spirits I talk about, then head on over to spiritskiosk.com, where you, as a Lush Life listener, will receive 10% off the entire site by quoting this code, all one word, a Lush Life 10 SK. That's a Lush Life 10 SK. Have fun shopping. Now let's talk liqueurs. It's so nice to see you again, and thank you for coming on the show again. Thank you, Susan. It's great to be back. I'm super happy, and I always love doing the show whenever I can. So, you know. Last time you were on, you were in a completely different role. So this is like a totally new Jamie. And so why don't you give a little intro to who you are and what you're doing now? Okay. So my name is Jamie Campbell, and I am the Bowles Brand Experience Manager, which is just a fancy title basically for kind of like a a mixed bag of everything. So effectively, I look after Bowles Geneva, Bowles Liqueurs, and Galliano for the UK market. And basically what I do is I act as a brand ambassador, first and foremost, to sort of train bartenders, consumers, anyone who wants to know about Bowles and the associated brands. But I also support that with kind of the day-to-day management of the brand as well. It's something that I wanted to start to work towards is actually having a bit of control over the brand and what it does in the UK market. So kind of one of my basic roles is to kind of like create the brand plan in terms of what the brand wants to do each year, taking direction from the global team, and then sort of implementing that in the UK market and then being able to support that with with the brand ambassador function and, and training people around the country to to understand what bowls is, how it's made and where it comes from. Because it's got a lot of history. There's a lot to talk about. So yes, we're definitely going to talk about some of that. But before we get into talking specifically about liqueurs, tell us a little bit about bowls and how bowls and liqueurs kind of come together. Okay, well, for anyone who doesn't know, Bowles is actually, it's the world's oldest distilled spirits company. And it was established in the outskirts of Amsterdam in 1575. So we're now talking kind of over 445 years ago, which is not bad going for a brand. And, you know, with everything going on in the world today, to say that we're still going is is, is pretty strong. And we're drawing upon those 445 years of experience to try and help us get through now, you know, and and all the craziness that we're dealing with. But um, the Bowles family themselves, they, they moved from Antwerp during the 80 years war and then landed in Amsterdam and when they got there they set up a kind of a really tiny actually really really tiny distillery called Hadlotia which is where they then began to produce an assortment of liqueurs and spirits and that's really where kind of our story if you like starts is once they they hit Amsterdam in 1575 which is why we always have 1575 on, on all of our bottles, kind of like our, our establishment date. We owe most of it to Lucas Bowles, who was the, the grandson of the founder. He was born in 1652. And, you know, we owe so much to him that we actually, we take his name and we put it on the bottle. So every single bottle of Bowles Geneva and, and liqueurs has his signature on the back because we owe so much to him. And the, the reason for that was, you know, Born in 1652, but he eventually took over the the Bowles business uh, from his grandfather and in doing so really put it on the map. He was also a major shareholder in the Dutch East India Trading Company, the VOC. And through that position, he really helped put Bowles on the map by being able to import and export all of the products that were coming in out of out of Amsterdam, you know, one of the largest trading ports in the world at the time. And effectively, what it meant is that Bowles had first pick of all of the herbs, spices, fruits, really anything you could sort of think of that were coming from all four corners of the world. And through this access to these various ingredients, Lucas Bowles decided to start 
playing around and sort of being a bit of a mad scientist with that and, and really trying to work out what could be created and, and sort of what we could do with all of this, you know, this abundance of flavor that's, that was at our, at our fingertips. And over time, he eventually sort of collated and amassed a, a collection of over 300 liqueurs recipes, which is just astounding for, you know, for that time, first and foremost, but just to be able to have that much knowledge and, and really to be able to create something that's so vast. And in doing so, you know, it also began to hone in on Geneva as a product as well and really start to draw upon that traditional Dutch spirit. But the liqueurs really were, first and foremost, his, his passion and his baby, if you like. And we saw those start to ship out across the world as well on these trading ships in the Dutch East India Trade Company. You know, they, these liqueurs managed to make their way into all four corners of the world themselves. And, and we see that in the likes of Sri Lanka, where Geneva is you know still one of the major imports and exports you know it's still consumed there to this day and the cures you know far and wide we see them all over the place particularly the brands that we have in our portfolio so it's fantastic to be able to trace that lineage all the way back to lucas bowls and and what he started all those many years ago it's incredible that he was able to reach so far and wide at that time do you have any of the original recipes we do so at the the house of bowls which is kind of our our museum if you like in amsterdam we have some of the original books and the actual original his original recipe book is encased in bulletproof glass almost to preserve the history of the brand and alongside that we have the original liqueurs bottles from all the way back in the 1500s and all the way through to to present day and you can see the the transformation from the old clay style bottles that were used for the Geneva's and the liqueurs to the more modern day bowling pins sort of shape that we see in the bowls liqueurs and the clay style bottles of the Geneva's that we have today. And so, yeah, we've got there's so much information available that we've been very fortunate enough to, to be able to hold on to. And it really helps us sort of draw a line from, from where we started to where we are today. And for anyone who might not know, what is a liqueur? <laughs> um, I know it's a simple question, but what is technically, what is a liqueur? It's a simple question with a very difficult and sort of convoluted answer. The easiest way to explain it is well, liqueurs are, I guess, typically made from a distilled spirit. Um, now, that can be anything from rum, whiskey, brandy, or even uh, neutral alcohol. And you can include vodkas or gins in there as well. So, you know, you can kind of have a liqueur made from any base alcohol. But these alcohols are then generally flavored with various herbs, spices, fruits, oils, and then usually sweetened as well. They're typically lower in alcohol, in ABV, than those hard spirits that they come from. But the ABV really fluctuates based on the type of liqueur that you're making as well. Some require a higher ABV, a higher alcohol content to allow the flavor profiles and the, the aromas and everything else to pull through. And other ones don't need quite so much. So even within the category, there are so many sort of subcategories and, and various flavors that it's there's no real simple answer to what a liqueur is, but generally it's a distilled spirit that's had some sort of flavoring and sweetener added to it is the, I guess, the easiest way to break it down. Well, so going back, I'm so interested in Lucas Bowles and that time and having so many in his repertoire, really, of, of flavors. Sugar was super expensive then. And, you know, fruit was expensive. Were these liqueurs only for the rich? I mean, how were people using them then? Uh, yeah, exactly that. So, I mean... The reason that we were able to get our hands on these ingredients is because of Lucas Bowles' position within the, the VOC, the, the trading company. You know, it, He effectively allowed Bowles to have these flavor profiles and various various flavors simply by his position and, and his access to them through that. I would have absolutely agreed that the liqueurs were generally for the the upper classes. You know, They were made particularly for, for special occasions, for a lot of the times we see some of our original uh, recipes that were made for engagements. So when a man was to marry a, uh, a wife, he would receive a, a liqueur as an engagement present, if you like. And we still have some of those recipes to date in, in the museum in, uh, in Amsterdam. So they would have generally been used either as gifts or for special occasions. It was very rare that the sort of the working or the lower classes would have access, had access to these liqueurs purely because of the cost of the ingredients at the time. It just wouldn't have been available. And what are some of the flavors that exist still today that existed then? Triple sec, very much so, is one of our kind of like oh. original flavors. And, you know, we use orange curacao. So we use curacao oranges to this day. We've always used those. And we try and stick to that as much as possible to, to maintain that heritage um, that was started 400 years ago. So, uh, yeah, triple sec is certainly up there. And it's one of our best selling flavors as well. You know, it's, it's phenomenal liquid. And it really does stand the test of time, as that's obviously quite apparent. So, yeah. Definitely one of those. 
Do you remember if there's one that doesn't exist today? You know, yeah, that you so, never even even heard of that fruit before? Yeah, so there's there's one that was one that was created and, and it doesn't really translate well into English and my Dutch is terrible. It's something I'm trying to work on. But it was a liqueur that was made basically for when the wives of sailors would see their husbands off to sea. And it kind of translates to kind of like wives tears or old wives tears. And it was effectively a liqueur that was created to help these women deal with the loss or the the leaving of their husband when they would go off on these trading ships and disappear for months, if not years at a time, traveling the world. It's not something that we make anymore. The recipe exists. It's always, I'd love to see it back into production, but I'm not sure how it tastes. And so I don't know if it would work, but it's got a really cool story to it. And, you know, based out of a, a port like Amsterdam, it's fantastic to see how that really ties into sort of the history of the area and, and everything that went on there. Are you allowed to tell us what ingredient it had? I don't even know. Everything is written in Dutch. So even trying to translate oh, you don't know. it. Oh, no. So it, yeah. So it had some flowers, which, you know, kind of were local to the area and so it was mainly it was quite a, a herbal liqueur shall we say so it's kind of something like i would probably imagine something similar to like benedictine or along those lines so it's definitely a herbal liqueur but there were some sort of floral aromas and floral flavors in there as well to kind of sweeten it a little bit so. the romantic in me wants there to be forget-me-nots in there you know one of the flowers exactly. you know, exactly. we can say that there are right. we'll say that there are and we'll just go with that so or if they ever create a new one we'll go oh yeah we'll add some forget-me-nots in that exactly. now Again, back back then, and we all we will come to the future soon or the the modern day soon. Back then, so they were getting them as presents, the liqueurs. How were they drinking them? Was it is it the same way? And we'll I guess we'll talk about the way we drink it today. But how how then did they drink it? So generally, then not necessarily just with with the bowls range, but liqueurs in general for the most part were kind of of the the herbal variety and would generally have been consumed to help alleviate ailments such as like sore throats or upset mm -hmm. stomachs or basically any problem you could think of, there would have been a liqueur that someone said it could cure the symptoms of. And things like, again, Benedictine or Chartreuse, which were created by monks at the time, they would generally mm -hmm. have been created as a, as a herbal remedy to all sorts of ailments and, and pains and aches and everything else. Bowls, however, we popularized flavors such as cherry and apricot brandy and creme de menthe, which were at points used for their medicinal purposes, but also as after dinner drinks and to, to be consumed for the fun of it as opposed for the, the medicinal property and so. And, and I guess they were drunk neat, right? Or do, is there any history of them being combined with water? Yeah, so generally, I think from, from what we've seen, certainly neat was the preferred and the go-to. I mean, you know, things like creme de menthe, for example, would certainly served neat and definitely chilled, whether that was with ice or it was chilled beforehand, but definitely neat was the preferred. It isn't until sort of the 1800s and particularly the late 1800s where bartending really took off in America and you had the likes of Professor Byron and, and, and Jerry Thomas and all of these original celebrity bartenders, if you like, that started to write books and create these, these cocktail books and these recipe books, whereby we started to see the combination of spirits and liqueurs in cocktails but it, in terms of earlier on sort of the 15 16 1700s it, we don't see as much of that it's certainly towards the latter half of the 1800s and sort of the 19th century where we see more of that yeah the first wellness cocktails i guess let's throw in some liqueur to make it good exactly for you, good for you exactly right? that, yeah yeah so we, you know, we have an excuse to drink which everyone wants nowadays so yeah exactly that did they ever try and combine it with the Geneva? they did we certainly did. And oh. it's actually, it's it's one of my, it's, it is my favorite cocktail and it's the Martinez. So, you know, kind of the story goes and it's generally recognized, but the Martinez was, you know, kind of the little brother of the Manhattan and the precursor to the Martini. It sort of, sort of sits in between the creation of those two cocktails and very classic, well-known cocktails, especially today. And the Martinez is, is sort of one that we see a bit more nowadays, but it's definitely one that's dipped in and out of of certainly popularity but especially knowledge you know in terms of people knowing what a martinez is but exactly that it was a combination of a really multi style of dutch geneva generally what we call genevas or genevas if you pronounce it in the dutch way and then the story goes that it was either dry orange curacao so like a, an orange liqueur made from or a curacao oranges or maraschino liqueur i personally like mine with a little bit of both and then italian vermouth as well so yeah, there's certainly combinations of Geneva 
and the kills over the, over the ages. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I forgot about the Martinez, and I do remember you liking a Martinez. That was one of your favorite cocktails, can, even back when we so met a billion thing. years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, let's fast forward to modern day. How do you see people drinking liqueurs now? Are they drinking them neat, or is it always in cocktails? Do you see everything? Absolutely. Yeah, quite honestly, we see a little bit of everything. I think it, it certainly varies kind of country to country as well. The drinking habits vary as much as the number and flavors of liqueurs that exist. You know, for example, in, in France and other French speaking countries, creme de menthe is often served as a, a digestif after dinner. And, you know, that's as true today as it was way back when. Whereas in Italy, you can often find an affogato served with a shot of coffee liqueur like Galliano Ristretto, which is one of ours as well, as well as the prerequisite shot of espresso itself. So, you know, I think the drinking habits are so varied just as much as the number of flavors of them are. And I think that's what really lends liqueurs to be so broad in their applications. You can quite honestly use them for anything. They can be drunk neat with coffee, with desserts, in a cocktail. The, the possibilities are endless, shall we say. But with bowls, we generally aim and like to try and use our liqueurs in cocktails. And the reason for that purely is because We've done all the hard work for you. You know, we've captured and created and harnessed the best of the ingredient that we're trying to create so that when you take a bottle home, you have access to the best flavor possible. You know, and you don't have to do the hard work. We've done that for you. It makes it easier for, you know, both the home and the bartender, I guess. I was going to ask this before. Is there a way to tell a good liqueur? If someone doesn't know anything about liqueurs and they're looking at a bottle, is it a certain sugar percentage or a certain percentage of fruit? Or, or how, how can someone know a good liqueur from a bad liqueur other than a brand name? Absolutely. If, it, if it's a brand that you recognize, you know, and if it's one that's been around for 445 years, I would generally say it's doing something okay. But honestly, and this, you know, please take this as responsible drinking. Try as many of them as you can. <laughs> it's really the only way, you know, try and, and experiment with them and taste because, you know, good liqueur is, is, I guess it's subjective, you know, it's down to what the person is looking for. If someone likes really sweet style liqueurs, then find the ones that suit your flavor profile or your taste palette. If someone wants things that are more herbal or floral or, or whatever it might be, then the only way to really understand and, and find what works is to try them all <laughs> and to try and find what fits for you. But when I'm looking for it myself, I kind of have a barometer in terms of what I look for. And I prefer to use liqueurs that have natural ingredients and botanicals so that you really get kind of the truest representation of the flavor that you're looking for. You know, so if, if they're using fresh or dried flowers, but you know, natural flowers instead of e numbers to create the the flavor profiles and that's where i think for me bowls really stands apart from not necessarily what what else is out there but certainly from from what we, maybe we used to do in the in the earlier years sort of more recently and and that's last year we took the decision to actually revert back to our original processes and now we only use natural botanicals and ingredients so as of last year really all of our bottles in our liqueurs range are made using 100% natural botanicals and ingredients which i think is a really strong move you know people want to understand the providence of what goes into their food and mm. what goes into their drink and we want to be able to provide them with that so everything is natural and the reason for that is to really create the, the truest flavor possible it takes more time and effort but we think it's worth it of course of course now following on from that about flavors i think it would just be fun to hear i'm really super interested in this what flavors have you seen either let's take from the 60s okay what flavors <laughs> were really popular then but are not so popular now and what flavors are super popular now? Yeah, absolutely. So I think creme de menthe especially is one that in the 60s and 70s, super, super popular. And then it kind of dipped out of popularity for a little while. And again, back then, you know, you would have seen in disco cocktails, uh, things like the grasshopper, for example, and drinks of, of that style. And it would have also been drank neat. Then it fell out of favor kind of in the 80s and 90s. And we're actually starting to see like a resurgence of people wanting to drink creme de menthe, uh, which is, I love, I absolutely love it. You know, the grasshopper is definitely a drink that's coming back. Alongside that, you know, I guess flavors like creme de cacao, you know, we're seeing golden Cadillacs come back into fashion and which is using, you know, our creme de cacao and Galliano, which I just love the fact that we've got a little bit of both in there. So I think we're seeing a resurgence of those classic or disco style cocktails, whichever you want to call them. Uh, and as a result, those flavors are really starting to come back. And particularly with what we've been experiencing for the past year or so in terms of the pandemic, you know, 
there are a lot more people wanting to make cocktails at home. And with that, they wanted to make cocktails that are easy and simple and don't require 55 different ingredients. And generally those cocktails are the classics that you would see in all the best cocktail bars, but maybe wouldn't have been made at home so so readily because of the, the difficulty in getting the right kind of ingredients. Whereas now with liqueurs, you, you can recreate that flavor that you need. And I think in terms of flavors, you know, our blue curacao is always one of our best sellers. Oh, I um, love it, really. Even yeah, from <laughs> exactly, like even to this day, blue curacao <laughs> is one of our best sellers, and not just in the UK but worldwide, which I just love. I love that. I yeah, love yeah. that too. And we share this love of creme de menthe too. Even as exactly. a child, I can go into that later. But you know, loving the taste of mint and mint chocolate cocktails, I was always a lover of the grasshopper from day one. Yeah. You you started to talk about home bartending, and that's what I was going to ask you next. Is so a lot of us are stuck home. And after hearing this, people are going to be like, yes, I'm going to try a cocktail with liqueurs. Other than triple sec, which mm -hmm. you said is probably, and, and of course it goes into, into some wonderful cocktails. Where do you think the home bartender should start when buying liqueurs? Which ones of the flavor profiles do you think are used in most cocktails and also some of the classic cocktails? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. If you're trying to build your bar cart, which I know, like, I mean, I've got one behind me, you know, right here. I can't not have a bar cart. But I, I would say if you're trying to build your, your home bar and trying to create kind of a range to start with, then really what you're looking for is, I think, as much of a range of flavors and styles as possible. So for me, I'd want to pick as like a general rule, like, at least a herbal liqueur, which tends to lean towards like the, the bitter end of the flavor profile. And they use, you know, various herbs, barks, grasses. So at least have something like that, you know, be it Benedictine, one of the bowls of liqueurs that sit into that flavor profile, or, you know, kind of the more classic, as I said, like monk and monastic style liqueurs, which are the backbone of a lot of cocktails, you know, be it a vieux carré, for example, and something like that. And then also you want to kind of balance that out with the, the fruit liqueurs that provide sweetness and floral notes and, the sweetest end of the spectrum. You know, and those things might be, for me, I like to always have a bottle of cherry brandy, for example. I love a Singapore sling, so cherry brandy is a must for that. And then creme de cassis, I love as well. And for me, I love a bramble, which traditionally would use creme de mure. But uh, we have a beautiful, beautiful creme de cassis, which I love, love to have. And like to, to play around with that flavor profile. And then, you know, those are kind of very classic. Then I'd say, look at more, I guess, contemporary style flavors, new ones that are coming out that allow you to experiment a little bit more with the drinks that you're making and for example bowls we released a watermelon and a cucumber liqueur last year which are incredible you know like really contemporary really kind of i'd say on brand for what we're seeing you know the cucumber is incredible it's probably one of my favorite in the 48 i want to say liqueur flavors that we've got available worldwide the cucumber is probably one of my top three and the reason for that is we add a little bit of salt so you've got that salinity that you get from natural cucumbers you have the that real like refreshing sort of like water burst it's just incredible so i'd say try and pick five or so flavors to start with and that might be a combination of a herbal liqueur two or three fruit um fruit liqueurs that are a little bit sweeter and then i'd say try something that's yeah more contemporary as i said you know something that's a little bit newer something that you can kind of play around a little bit more with and create your own new cocktails you know in the uk we've got 15 flavors of bowls so if you want to buy all 15 go ahead you know, it certainly gives you enough to start with. but um, <laughs> Of course. <laughs> but yeah, I'd say start smaller and work your way up. You know, like invest in your home bar and start to build up your collection. And as you become more comfortable, if you, you know, if you've never bartended before, pick three flavors or three cocktails that you want to try. And I'd say start with classic. So, you know, maybe try, if you like whiskey, try an old fashioned. It doesn't have a liqueur in it, but it's super simple. Or if you like a gin-based drink, the Singapore Sling, it's got quite a few ingredients, but they're all liqueurs for the most part, besides the gin. And if you want to use pineapple juice, depending on, on how you want to try it. But I'd say pick three or four cocktails that you really want to sort of try and have them as different styles and then build your home bar around those. And then over time, you can start to invest in more and more products, more and more brands, more and more spirits and liqueurs flavors and sort of add to them as you become more comfortable with what you're doing on, you know, making the drinks. So. Of course, you always have to start with the drinks that you love because you're exactly. going to be wanting to drink those, you know, consistently and get it better and better. Exactly. But, you know, I was so stuck in the past that I didn't even think of asking you about innovation in liqueurs. I'm so glad you brought that up because, hey, Eastern Standard is one of my favorite cocktails. So when you were talking about cucumber, 
I thought that would be amazing in an Eastern standard. Are you always innovating and deciding, okay, we're going to add new flavors? And after that, how do you decide which flavors or which new flavor profiles to explore? That, quite honestly, is the best part of the job. Inside our House of Bowls, where the museum and the House of Bowls experiences, you know, where you get to, to walk around and sort of, I guess, relive the past 445 years. We also have above that, we have an entire floor dedicated to R&D, to research and development. And, mm-hmm. you know, that is where the like mad scientist stuff happens. So we have Pete, who's our master distiller. He's 80... 80 plus. So he's been, he's been our master distiller for a while and Pete knows everything there is to know about liqueurs in Geneva. And and that's where a lot of our innovation comes from. You know, it's Pete has an incredible palate, an incredible flavor profile, and he's supported by amazing assistant distillers like Monique, for example, who's again, fantastic. Like, uh, her grandfather was a perfumer. So again, like an incredible sense of smell and, and flavor and understanding of those. So that's where a lot of our, I guess, the beginning comes from. And then we have our entire research and development department where it's honestly like a, a biology lab. You know, there are test tubes and uh, microscopes and Bunsen burners on all the time. That's where the cool stuff really happens. You know, that's where the Frankenstein stuff sort of. And I think as a, as a process, what we try and look at is what do our consumers want? What do the people drinking our liqueurs want? What cocktails do they want to be drinking? What flavors do they want to be working with? And what is on trend in the world now? What is happening now? that we can kind of tap into and really harness? And then how do we then also look proactively and, and, and look forward to what might be coming down the pipeline next? And I think that's where, you know, cucumber and watermelon were a great example of that. You know, they're really light, refreshing style flavors. And if you look at the rise of the spritz cocktail, for example, we're seeing more and more people want drinks that are light and refreshing and something they can sip by the beach with the sun umbrella and everything else. And those flavor profiles really work. So we've got some incredible cocktails that we came up with, with watermelon liqueur, some Prosecco, some soda, you know, just a watermelon spritz, but it is tasty, really tasty and super refreshing. And then there are other flavors that we created a pumpkin spiced liqueur, which is as wild as it sounds, you know, pumpkin spice lattes in the autumn are everywhere. And we wanted to be able to have a bit of tongue in cheek fun with that and, and create something where, you know, make a pumpkin spiced margarita, whatever it might be. It's wild. Like the, the possibilities are endless, as I said before. Yeah, and I think that's where, as long as there is flavor in the world, we will always try to tap into that and harness it and create something new and fun and exciting. And then with that as well, in terms of innovation, as I said, you know, we've still got the same sort of bowling pin style shaped bottles, but it's not just flavor that we try to innovate on. We try and innovate on what people want to do with cocktails and how they learn. So, you know, these bottles now, which are brand new in terms of the labels that we've included, they now have QR codes on the back. So you can scan the QR code and it takes you through to our House of Bowls uh, portfolio where we have every cocktail that you can think of. And it takes you through the processes of how to make them as well. So you can scan it with a QR reader on your phone, takes you through to the page, and then you've got the entire cyclopedia of Bowls knowledge of 445 years of cocktails. And it shows you videos on how to make these cocktails at home. And I think that's really important, especially with what we're going through now, to have that kind of forethought from a business that's 445 years old, I think is incredible. And that's why I love the brand and what they do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. The, le- the next question I was going to ask you was, could you recommend a few cocktails, like one <laughs> if you were in a in a, in a winter skiing chalet mm-hmm. or another one if you were on the beach? And I think that you have just told me those. Number one, the pumpkin yeah. spice toddy. And then on the beach, definitely that watermelon spritz. And yep. I assume that both of those recipes are also on your site. Exactly. Yeah. With the pumpkin spice, they've got loads of different pumpkin spice recipes. That flavor isn't available in the UK at the moment. It's something that we're looking at bringing in, but I've tried it and it's crazy. It's amazing. It tastes exactly like you'd expect a pumpkin spice latte to taste from Starbucks, for example. And so, yeah, that's, that's amazing. I have a feeling that a lot of people might be drinking that one neat. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, over some ice is delicious. A little bit of an orange twist, again, is fantastic. But yeah, certainly the pumpkin spice for winter is amazing. For me, as I said before, the Martinez is my favorite and it's such a warming drink. So Martinez personally for me is is certainly one that I go to in the winter. And then, yeah, any of those spritz style flavors for for the summer where you're sat by the beach, you've got like a thermos of pre-batched cocktail and you can just top it up with the Prosecco and the soda as you're sat by the pool or, you know, on the sun lounger. So, yeah. Oh, I hope this summer. We hope now. (laughs) 
Now, I know you've given me lots of top tips for the home bartender, but if there is one, one big one that they go, okay, Jamie Campbell says to do this, what would that be? Oh, with your bull's hat on or not, it doesn't have to be totally liqueur related. That's a good one. But to be honest, I think it goes back to what I said before. Pick five, and we'll, we'll just give five as an example. You know, It could be three, it could be four, but I'd say five because it's a good way to start. Pick five of your favorite flavors. And, and I don't just mean from bowls, liqueurs or liqueurs in general, but just flavor profiles that you like. Do you like the taste of oranges? Do you like the taste of mint? Do you like the taste of chocolate? Like, what is your favorite flavor? And from there, you can quite literally make hundreds of combinations of drinks whilst you get used to making them at home. And as I said before, from that, you can start to branch out and add to your collection. But I'd say pick five, add them to your collection at home and pick the five flavors that you just flat out love. And then I'd say before you start to play around with them in cocktails, try them neat when you get them so you really understand what they taste, you know, how they taste them and, and what they taste like. You know, is your chocolate liqueur really bitter or is it more like a milk chocolate liqueur? Is it a little bit sweeter? Has it got a little bit more nuttiness to it? You know, that then helps you understand what you can do with it as a result and, and what it might pair well with. You know, if you're looking at a banana liqueur, let's say banana is one of your favorite flavors and you want to get your hands on a banana liqueur. You know, what does banana work with? You know, in my head, I immediately go to rum and things like pineapple. And then you've got things like a pina colada, which you can make. So it's about, I guess, trying to marry the flavors and trying to think of what works well with what. And I think that's probably the easiest and the best way to get started. And it's how professional bartenders really get started as well. You know, they w look at what they've got in front of them, much like a chef does or, you know, anyone who's trying to create something. What tools do you have in front of you and how do they combine and how do they come together to create something incredible? And I think that's probably my top tip is what do you have and how do they marry? Like how can you combine them to make something that's delicious and tasty and consistent, which is where the cures really play their part is, you know, as I said before, we've done the hard work for you in creating them. So you don't have to worry about making a banana liqueur from scratch and potentially not getting the ratios right and then it's different each time you have to make it the consistency in a bottle liqueur is what provides part of the magic is it's, it doesn't change you know so you can make the same drink over and over again and it will be the same over and over again if you follow the recipe i think that's what's really important i think that's a that's a great tip thank you and i'm gonna leave you asking the question that i always ask everyone is <laughs> Of course, right now it's a little bit more poignant, but if you could be anywhere drinking anything right now, where would that be? Ooh, that is a good question. I would say I want to be somewhere hot and Bora Bora is one of my like, like <gasps> dream destinations. So I definitely say Bora Bora and I cannot say no to a pina colada. So pina coladas and Bora Bora on the beach, on the private stilted like pool, that's, that's where I want to be right now. So. Oh, that sounds good to me. Well, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to leave you thinking of that, thinking of that beautiful, oh gosh, that space and water. And uh, it was great to have you on the show. And thanks for discussing the cures. I've learned thank so much. You. No, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And thank you for, oh, thank for letting you. me talk about bowls a little bit. Absolutely. Thanks so much to Jamie for joining me on the show today. I'm a liqueur lover. So I might end every night trying a different bowl's flavor from now on. Jamie's and my favorite disco cocktail is on the menu for today's Cocktail of the Week. I think the Grasshopper is the most disco of all disco cocktails. And that's why it's our Cocktail of the Week. Add all of the following ingredients to a shaker. One ounce bowls green creme de menthe, one ounce bowls white creme de cacao, and one ounce heavy cream. Then add ice and shake, shake, shake. Then strain it into a chilled coupe glass and pop some mint leaves on top. The best dessert. You'll find this recipe, more disco cocktails, and all the cocktails of the week at a lushlifemanual.com where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. So, I used to dip my finger into the creme de menthe bottle every so often when I was young, about eight years old. I had no idea that my parents were watching it disappear and blamed my older brother. They only found out a few years ago when I said, remember that bottle? They looked at me and screamed, that was you? So 
If you live for Lush Life, make sure you're giving back to the bars or restaurants you love by donating or taking part in cocktail or food delivery where you live. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with, with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly and wash your hands and wear a mask. Next week, we'll be exploring how to drink Calvados with my friends at Avalan. The bees will be buzzing. Until that time, bottoms up.